Okay, how inaccurate are your training zones set by your watch? And is that leading you to overtrain or undertrain? Are you doing a recovery run or easy run and you think you're in zone one or zone two, but actually, based on the zones on your Garmin, Apple Watch, Strava, you're actually in zone three and overtraining. Is your watch telling you you're in zone four and zone five when actually you're nowhere near that? And so all the indicators from the app that's connected to your watch are completely out, including recovery time, your fitness, what training session to do next, and of course, your race prediction times. I'm Lee Grantham, a coach and a professional ultra runner. And I went from not being able to run for 500 meters to being able to run 100K and become British champion in six hours and 42 minutes. And now I help runners to do the same. So if you've got the work ethic, the discipline, and ideally a positive attitude, and you want the coaching, the guidance, and the knowledge of somebody who's been there and helps runners to get there, then please book a coaching call in the link in the description. In this video, I'm gonna show you exactly why the zones set by your watch are not just holding you back, they're hurting you, and certainly keeping you away from reaching your potential. I made a video and posted a few days ago on zone three. And there were a lot of comments because there's actually a lot of controversy around training in zone three. But the data is quite obvious to see that if you're running between two hours and three hours 30 for the marathon, the vast majority of that time is going to be spent in zone three. And this is the type of comment that I got from that video. Adrian, this is where I think my training was lacking because I did easy runs very easy and intervals very hard, but the last two long runs where I put some marathon pace workouts, it felt unsustainable. I actually did tempo threshold workout at around 168 to 173 beats, but rarely touched this zone three around 158 to 165 beats, I guess. So let's just say that those zones that he's got are absolutely dialed in, and I'll show you how to get those dialed in later on in the video. Essentially, he's facing the problem that most marathon runners face, and that is the intervals are as hard as they possibly can be, a nine or 10 out of 10 perceived effort, and the long runs a long, slow distance in zone one and zone two. So you're essentially training for something completely different. There's no specificity in the training that you're doing towards a marathon. And that is why so many runners get it wrong and they are fine for the first hour, maybe even an hour and a half, and then they start to crumble. And then it's a war of attrition to the finish just to get it done. And they're either slowing down or worse, they're not able to finish. I got another great comment from Conrad. Lee, I switched to the Hansen's plan for my recent marathon block. To the derision of some people, because the longest run was only 16 miles, but the longer zone three intervals on a Tuesday, six times a mile, two times three miles, etc., at 10 seconds faster than marathon pace, and the Thursday marathon pace run of 10 miles completely revolutionized what I've been doing. And then I reply, comrade, how are you calculating marathon pace? When he says, but the longer zone three interval sessions on a Tuesday, six times a mile, two times three miles, run at 10 seconds faster than marathon pace. And then for the Thursday marathon pace run up to 10 miles. He responds based on the Hansen's calculator plus what felt manageable over the weeks and months. So I was aiming for 325 in the marathon, about 450 per kilometer, but I had been running my marathon pace runs around 445 per kilometer, which is ultimately what I held for the whole marathon. So first of all, Hansen, fantastic. And of course the method works based on you trying to put something together for me internet, typing something into AI, but here's the problem with the Hansen's calculator and any calculator, running calculator, whether it's equivalent times or whether it's trying to give you paces for workouts in a schedule towards a half marathon, marathon, 5K, whatever you're training for. You go to the page, you put in the distance, the marathon that you're training for, you put in the target time, and sometimes you put in the temperature as well, Celsius or Fahrenheit. So. You've already decided right now, and that can be as ambitious 
or as conservative as you want it to be, that target time. But you've decided three, six, 12 months before you're actually gonna do the race, what paces you're gonna be running at, whether you're doing marathon pace or as Conrad says, 10 seconds faster than marathon pace. So what are the obvious problems there? Well, if we're over ambitious and we pick a time that's beyond us, very quickly we're gonna get into trouble in the form of illness, burnout, injury. If the time is not too ambitious, you might get away with that training for two, three weeks, and then all of a sudden there'll be an overall fatigue and you won't be able to hit the sessions, which leads to doubt, insecurity, but ultimately setbacks. If you're conservative with what you want to achieve, or if you're basing it off what you've just done in the marathon or your half marathon time and what you would like to do, it's still an estimate. And although it won't get you into trouble as quick, it's likely that for the previous marathon and for the marathon that you're building towards, you're massively underachieving. And this is why you see me post success stories of 10%, 20%, 30% faster within often a single training block of three months. So let's say Conrad is super ambitious. He puts in a time that he's not at the moment capable of. All of a sudden, He's going into zone four and zone five when he's doing his intervals and maybe even that marathon pace plus 10 seconds faster. And maybe he's running his marathon pace also in zone four. It's exactly the same if you are trusting your watch or an app to estimate your zones. Everybody is very individual when it comes to heart rate and when it comes to training zones. And this comment, it perfectly leads me on to this next part of why it is likely your training zones are wrong if you are listening to your watch or an app. And then I'm gonna tell you a much better way for you to train for your next half marathon, marathon, 5K. So your Garmin calculates lactate threshold zones based on your lactate threshold heart rate. First of all, that's a sum based on your training. So you might have one week of training, you might have five years of training. Zone four, above this would be zone five, right? Zone four is 95% to 99% of lactate threshold heart rate. And zone three is 88 to 94% of again, that lactate threshold heart rate. Would you agree? Now I answered that question really quickly because just two minutes before, I'd analyzed the training session of somebody who's training towards Houston Marathon. I just this minute analyzed the long run. Based on the Garmin zones, she spent just under 50 minutes in zone five, which is impossible, and just under 10 minutes in zone three. In reality, because she's working optimally through our method, she never crossed over LT2. She never got past zone three. It was the perfectly executed session, but Garmin would tell her that she's massively overtraining. Now this is exactly the same race side by side, 50 kilometers uphill. The first indication that the zones are hugely out is that they change from one year to the next. For a well-trained athlete, your zones are not gonna change very much, maybe one or two beats, but certainly not 20 beats. The second thing again that's obvious is a human cannot be in zone five for 40, 41 minutes. A human can also not be in zone four by definition for three hours or three hours and five minutes. And in addition, what I can tell you from personal experience, because these are my races, is that second graph on the right, that effort was so much easier for me that I finished the race, I got down the mountain, and I had an afternoon cycling session. The first on the left couldn't move for two or three days. And just to show you how this actually affects the data you're getting back from Garmin in this case, but they are best in class. This is just a simple interval session, hill intervals with a nice mix of zone three and zone four. Again, there's no way a human being can spend 39, 40 minutes in zone five. And so what you see there is of course the session based on the effort that I'm putting into each rep and the heart rate recovery is solid that it's not out of control. It's not unsustainable. The biomechanics 
a solid, but because of those heart rate zones that are incorrect, and I know them to be incorrect, Garmin would have me as overreaching. So the load, the training load is too much, when in actual fact, it's exactly what I need. So how can we do it better? How can we train exactly to our correct zones? Or what is better than the zones set by your watch, your app, or a generalized calculation that will be exactly correct for a few people. And the differences there are training age. How long have you been training? And how have you been training? And that's just one of many, many factors. That's a clear explanation, but having well-defined zones is crucial here. What's the difference between a properly lab-defined zone and a percentage of maximum heart rate approach. We could also look at as the lactate threshold zones set by Garmin and how can you achieve similar results using both methods? Now that's a beautiful question. And really it is the question from training suboptimally to getting you training somewhere near methodically so that you can achieve towards your potential. So I responded, it's a great point and question. The percentage of heart rate max or VO2 max is a generalization and varies substantially from runner to runner, dependent on many factors, including training age. And just to throw a spanner in the works, if you have a lab defined test, it all depends on who's analyzing that test. 90% of the time, zones, thresholds need to be moved. So. Let's say you walk into a lab, you're getting serious about your training and you wanna remove all doubt, you wanna stop guessing with your watch calculations, you wanna start training to exactly your physiology. You walk into a lab to do a lactate threshold test, what matters? Of course, the protocol matters. And are the lab willing to adapt to the gold standard protocol so that we're getting the very best data possible? Are we doing that test at exactly the right time, not just in your training, but in the week so that you can get the optimal data. Now I've seen thousands of tests from around the world and unless you handle that process with kid gloves, it is nine out of 10 times, maybe eight out of 10 times, the protocol is gonna be wrong. And sometimes it is so wild. For example, you go in to do a lactate threshold test and you're training for a marathon. But the lactate threshold test that they perform stays at the same pace, you hop on the treadmill, stays at the same pace throughout the test and what changes, what makes it more and more difficult as you pass each stage is the gradient. So again, essentially we're testing for something completely different than what we are trying to achieve. Running a flat marathon, a road 5K, 10K, half marathon, whatever the goal is. And so what happens, all the data points are completely out, almost useless. I've seen people go in for a lactate threshold test as a runner, and not only have they not read the protocol and are not maybe willing to adjust to the gold standard protocol, the test actually happens on a bicycle, which is, again, asking a fish to climb a tree and judging it on its ability. You're doing something completely different, which is gonna mean the zones, the threshold, everything is out. And again, it's useless. It's money wasted. And that is just the tip of the iceberg. There is a thousand problems that can happen with that. And another big factor, as I've just mentioned in the comments, is who is performing the test? And more important than that, who is analyzing that data from a very distance running perspective. If you walk into a doctor's office and you say, I've got knee pain, he looks at it, he asks you some questions and you tell him you're running 30 miles, 50 miles, 80 miles a week. Unless he is a runner or a sports person, he's probably gonna tell you to run less or not run for a few weeks until that heals, right? It's exactly the same when it comes to such an important test like this. And so, Unless the test follows the protocol, the gold standard protocol, when we get the test back, if the athlete, the runner does the test, 90% of the time, the zones need altering. And it's quite substantial. And a little bit less than that, around 70 to 80% of the time, the thresholds are in the wrong place. And so that leads to money wasted, frustration, and also not so much better than what your watch might be telling you. So you've wasted time, 
effort, money, and you're still no closer to knowing exactly how to train to the marathon. What is infinitely more accurate than the zones set by your watch or an app or a general calculation is your perceived effort. So those intervals that I read earlier from a comment, all out, nine or 10 out of 10, can we understand what an eight out of 10 feels like? Because that's your zone four. For the specificity in a long run, can we get to grips with and fully understand how it feels to go from the top of zone two, conversational still, into zone three, where you can get out a sentence, but you'd prefer not to speak. And that is not easy, but unless you master that and master it to a point that if you get to the marathon and your watch has died and you're on the start line of the marathon, you have no problem pacing the entire marathon because you're pacing it by feel. By that point, you know from the training schedule, hopefully enough data points to know exactly when you're in zone two, when you're in zone three, and when you're in zone four. And what that will also do for you is like Conrad, instead of saying, okay, six months from now, I wanna run three hours 15 for the marathon, completely plucked from thin air at random. What that allows you to do, if you get to grips with the eight out of 10 and six out of 10 perceived effort is get the absolute maximum out of your body during the training and if you think about it and how that relates to pace, naturally you're gonna become more efficient at that eight out of 10 and that six out of 10. So you're gonna become faster at that six out of 10 and eight out of 10. Now there are levels to this game and this could be a three hour video. What you get on our method is removing all doubt and getting the absolute most out of your training body and not only that, you're on the start line and you know exactly how to pace it, which means you're often negative splitting, but you're certainly PB in by a long way because you've gone from suboptimal training to being treated like an elite athlete with consideration for everything else that's happening in your life. You can't just give somebody the optimal marathon plan, whether it's the Hansen's method or something else. And I see this a lot with advanced marathoning, 24 week plan, and it's essentially geared up for somebody who's a professional athlete. So it's not taking into consideration your job, your children, family commitments, travel, commitments, everything else that comes into the picture. But I can tell you this for sure, both of those methods, Hansen's and advanced marathoning, are by far better than any app that is on the market right now. And if you speak to physiotherapists, these apps are causing overtraining and injuries. But let me know what you think and let me know your experience, whether it's Garmin, Cora, Sunto, or your Apple Watch, and how much you rely on those zones to work in to prepare for your next race, whether that's 5K or marathon. <laughs>